Hello, Ryan here, and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see, and let's get on with it. This week, the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo kicks off. New ships and vehicles are flying out of the IAE. Plus, Star Citizen Live talks all about the work going on for all things FPS, and it is not to be missed. So this week's Star Citizen Live was a full hour talking with the FPS team, answering all of our questions regarding all things FPS. It was a great Q&A. There is a ton of information to get through, so make sure you are relaxed, grab yourself a drink, and get ready to ingest it all. This is going to take a little while. First question is, what will the first implementation of hand salvage look like? So hand salvage straight off will be hull stripping, and this will be using a beam from either the multi-tool or a dedicated two-handed tool. With the dedicated two-handed tool capable of stripping the materials faster, capable of carrying a larger capacity of materials, as well as probably giving you a much more informative UI readout. You will use these tools to strip off the materials from a derelict ship, store it in the canister, and for the first implementation, you will be scraping a very generic material, regardless of where you are stripping the materials from. And the materials that you gather can then be sold on as part of the whole salvaging profession and gameplay loop, or it can be used for repair, which is essentially the reverse of stripping materials off, applying them to the ship instead. So you're basically burning away and taking off the metals from the ship hull, revealing the skeleton underneath, and then when you repair them, you are reapplying that material to the ship hull, filling in those holes. But of course, that reapplied material will not be the same colour as the ship, as it doesn't paint the material as well. So over time, if someone has been keeping their ship all patched up, you will begin to see it covered in these little shiny fillings dotted around the ship. Now, this is going to be the same functionality that they use for the Drake Vulture, which, as it stands right now, hand salvaging and Vulture-specific ship salvaging are both scheduled to come around 318, all fingers being crossed. Uh, the Vulture will be able to do it on a much larger scale, of course, compared to its FPS counterpart. Now, for Tier 0, they did say they are aiming to allow us to remove weapons and potentially components from ships and then reuse them or sell them on, but this is an internal stretch goal that the team are really hoping to achieve and striving for, but they can't 100% guarantee it. They do really want to get this in, but they also still need to figure out the best way of doing this. For example, do you cut around the attachment point and then pull that out using a tractor beam, or how does this kind of work it still needs to be determined. Now, the next iteration, so on from this first iteration of hand salvaging, after this initial drop, will be stripping individual materials from ships. And so when you look at a ship with an appropriate tool, you will get a UI readout, and that will show you A, what the hull integrity is, which will allow you to determine whether you want to strip materials, or maybe just restore the hull to get it back to its former glory. And B, you will get to see what each material is, and you can decide which materials to strip and which to leave, which will cater into the economy, so certain materials being worth more than others. Now, when it comes to repairing, each material may provide better or worse integrity depending on where you're applying it and where you've taken it from. So aiming to match the materials would be better than just slapping anything on it. Anyway, further down the line, you will be cutting off parts of the ship and using the Reclaimer's Claw. But I really love how even Tier Zero is sounding. And it does sound as though when Salvage Tier Zero does come along, Repair Tier Zero may come alongside it. Of course, the real skill with salvaging, I, from what I can see at the moment on face value, is knowing exactly where the best or most valuable materials are located on each ship without having to rely on a scanner. And each ship will obviously be different as well. You know, the materials of value on an Aurora will be different to that of a Valkyrie and so on and so forth. But I would really love it if they could get to the point where you have to be very careful not to hit systems that could cause maybe a catastrophic explosion like in that game hard space shipbreaker i have full expectations that this is their direction but only once i suppose the resource generation and item control system is in and maybe even things like life support and fuel will that be possible anyway really enjoyed listening to this run through of what tier zero salvage will look like very excited to get it in our hands fingers crossed next year now, next question. Everything seems to be using beams rather than tactile interactions with our hands. Why is this? 
Now, firstly, they say it's just a great way to get the first implementation of each system in using systems like the multi-tool as all it really requires is an attachment swap. And this just allows them to bring the system in quicker without relying on deeper animations. Salvaging, for example, will initially be using a beam to strip the hull, but as salvage expands, you will be interacting with components and, and physically grabbing them, so evolving to more than just controlling a beam. Down the line, many of these systems will be a lot less simpler than just using a beam, but as an entry into these mechanics, beams are very handy. Now, there is another issue with having more tactile interactions, especially in an MMO, when you could be attacked at any moment. And where a beam will allow you to instantly disengage from what you're doing and protect yourself, using a more hands-on system which kind of locks you into an animation doesn't always feel great in many situations, as they would be taking control away from the player. Now, I do agree with this to some degree with what they're saying, that having a multiplayer game take control of your character, even for a few seconds, can create some really irritating issues and it doesn't feel good either. But at the same time, I want Star Citizen to be visceral and I would certainly like more of a hands-on engaging interaction for something like medical, for example. And I do expect as the game further develops and they enhance much of the various FPS mechanics like medical, for example, we will get a much more hands-on system that both caters for the tactility of being hands-on, like applying bandages kind of, or applying pressure, uh, as well as allowing players to break off at any moment, perhaps. I feel they will achieve both and I really hope they do, but of course, for the first steps into these systems, for me personally, a beam will certainly suffice. Next question, are there any plans to redo the player interaction system when holding the F button, as the floating text can be quite problematic? And they say, yes, they will be reworking the system to use the personal interaction wheel. And when you hover over an item, it'll still highlight it like it does now, but you won't automatically have all the interaction options appear on screen and float next to it you can create maybe a default interaction that is contextual to the item that you are looking at and makes sense to the item like maybe pick up or pick up and store for example. They will be flexible for players to be able to set their own default interactions for these items or you could just right click on them and then have the interaction wheel for more options rather than floating text which does sound a lot better. Next question, will there be a significant cost to recharging energy weapon magazines like off of a ship's power grid? And will there be a distinction between laser energy and plasma energy? Now they say there will be upsides and downsides to all weapons, ballistics obviously having limited ammunition, whereas energy can be recharged. For ballistics, of course, you will be able to eventually scavenge items and, or ammo from bodies in the future, so stripping magazines. But for energy weapons, you will be able to recharge spent ammo packs using suits or power suits. They will be bringing the need for many armor suits to require power and you could attach energy magazines to trickle charge them up. So ideal for long duration expeditions where a weapon may be required but you don't want to run the risk of running out of ballistic ammunition. And these will take power away from the suits of course, more actually about powered suits and different types of suits later on in this video. Now the downsides to energy weapons is wear and overheat. So as weapons fire, they all generate wear. For energy weapons, these can also overheat if fired for too long. The environment will play into it. So if you're in a hot environment, weapons will heat up quicker than in a cold environment, allowing them to go longer or cool down faster. Even atmospheric pressure will play into it. Now this could then allow you to get more or less out of a particular weapon depending on its characteristics. So something very real to think about when you are deciding on what to take for each mission based on what you're doing, where you're going and so on. Uh, and of course managing your weapons will be a kind of a skill to learn each of their strengths and weaknesses as you go. So you will find favourites I'm sure. Uh, now the next question was to just elaborate more on this wear and dirt. And wear and dirt are separate systems but do work closely together. They both apply to everything in the game, not just weapons. It could be suits, clothing, ships, components, pretty much anything will gain wear and dirt depending on, on how they're treated. Now for wear, let's say on weapons for example, this can be when you're shooting them, gaining wear decreases the weapon's durability. And when its durability decreases, it could then create a misfire of varying severities. More on this in a second. With dirt, the dirtier the weapon is, the more wear it can gain. So maintaining every one of your items or weapons will be relatively necessary if you are out in an area where you're gaining a lot of dirt. Dirt is built up based on what you are doing and where you do it. So environments will generate the dirt which you will see build up on your weapon. Maybe in a red sandy desert, for example, will show the red grit 
built up on your sh on your weapon and then snow or ice on planets like microtech which over time will cause wear also things like dropping a weapon on the ground going prone for example will build up the dirt quicker than say staying in a space station so it will make sense to where you are but they also did specify that this will happen over a long period of time it's not something that's just going to instantly happen the moment you dive into the dirt or drop a weapon on the ground it will be a long duration thing and if you are maintaining them as and when you you can then obviously that will keep it going now weapons do also have their own hp and can receive damage and if they receive enough damage then they break and this means that everything you find around in the verse will have various wear dirt durability and health to them all so you'll have to pick and choose everything you find which will affect its performance and value as well and this will affect its functionality of course now i love how they are creating more of a thought process and individuality with everything we find for example you could find a broken but very rare weapon and choosing that to fix it up maybe over a functioning weapon that you already have would be a better choice now when it comes to misfires there are three severities you've got minor major and critical minor being something like a dry fire a major being a jam which would need clearing and then critical could be the weapon just falls apart and is no longer useful this will probably only occur once that hp reaches zero though now they are still working on other potential uh, issues like maybe a loss of accuracy but if you keep all your weapons in good condition then your weapons will be fine now personally i love this whole idea maintaining everything looking after everything storing things correctly in containers to reduce the amount of wear it will really make you appreciate and feel more attached to the items that you own rather than just constantly throwing them away if you look after them you can keep the same weapon almost indefinitely i expect and all of this will apply to armor clothing devices weapons ships components and everything else you can imagine really amazing stuff plus it means that players will need a variety of things as certain items equipment and weapons may be more suitable for particular environments or reasons researching where you're going and making the right decision on what to take will be very important and i love that next question can we get a fireman carry rather than just dragging and they say yes the drag is more intended for short range rescue animations whereas the fireman carry is for longer ranges so you won't want to be dragging someone across a rocky surface for a long distance as it could do more damage than good uh, they have been discussing this and this will also apply to maybe stealth carrying a body and hiding a body inside something so it will be something for the future completely agree having a fireman carry style will be so much use so i'm glad that they are bringing that in uh, next question can you talk a little bit about hacking uh, so they will be replacing what we have now which is just a hacking chip and then sticking it into a machine with a hacking device that you can carry and equip in your hand and then you will use the hacking chips more as ammunition for the device i guess they will have different strengths and weaknesses like they do now uh, but this will allow you to hack into various things in the verse wirelessly now when you hack into a system you will be presented with a 3d visualization of a network and you will be able to move around in this network and manipulate the network to open up new paths and routes with the objective being to find weak points where you can insert kind of a trojan horse and then you will connect them all up together and you will gain access to counter this there will be antivirus systems that will try to stop you and make it difficult for you which allows for the difficulty scaling as well easier hacks being smaller and quick to complete with harder hacks having more and better antivirus systems now they're also creating a command prompt method as well which i am truly happy about allowing players to type commands to control the hack which will have various bonuses applied so i suppose the simple version is more like a pac-man mini game in a way where you are moving through a maze of sorts avoiding these antivirus ghosts trying to find weak spots then injecting the trojan horse in various locations to then override the system i am so grateful that they are now also implementing more of a real world hacker option personally i wouldn't have the first idea of how to hack anything but i do feel like having these options that are closely tied to real life versions give players more options and understanding off the bat if that is something that they want to get good at and with star citizen being a skill-based game this will give players the chance to make a name for themselves in the verse as a hacker being able to then charge more for their work for example so i'm quite happy that if this is one of the reasons why they pushed it back 
to develop it further before releasing it, then I am more than happy for that. And really look forward to seeing this in game. Whether I delve into the whole hacker gameplay or have someone in my org or my crew that is just the best or way better than most of us, I don't know yet. I'm sure I will try and learn it as much as I can, but it's not technically something I'm generally good at. But I like that it gives other players the potential to gain reputation with this, uh, as well as owning another new device. I love all these different devices. I will collect them all. So hacking will be used to gain access to a system or part of a system like a door, for example, hacking in to unlock it, opening up a new path or a lootable option. It could also be computers, terminals, or maybe things that control gravity, life support, even loot containers can be hacked into and opened up. Basically, whatever the level designers want to apply hacking to, they can. Eventually, you'll be able to hack someone's ship, which will lead to a full PvP style hacking and counter hacking. You'll get a notification that someone's maybe trying to hack into your ship and gain access, and then you can take control of the AI antivirus system to try and stop them. So this will have clearly so many facets to it from basic door hacking to full system navigation, being hunted, playing cat and mouse with the antivirus and other players trying to gather the information you need. It sounds pretty fantastic. There will be various higher end protection available depending on what you are trying to protect, of course, but they are really trying to sell that hacking fantasy, visualizing it so people can understand it easily, but also then providing the option for really skilled players to excel. Uh, great for data runners as well, trying to steal or protect their data. And I'm quite happy that they took this real world path. And they did say that they have been playtesting this internally and say it's working really well. And I think it is now slated to release in 3.18. So some really impressive systems coming down the line. Next question, can we get a select all for dragging loot from one storage container to another please? And they say yes, they are continuing to update and improve the inventory system. That will come as well as a search feature to find exactly what you want, highlighting the character when the camera is behind a wall, and many more improvements to come. 3.15 was literally just the first implementation of this. Next question, there are new ammo types on the roadmap. Can you elaborate on these? So there is now plasma and incendiary. Uh, these, I think, have been on there for a little while now, but there are more damage over time. So you'll do an initial damage, and then there will be a burn damage. And the example that he gave for incendiary is that you could be maybe using an LMG and you could fire these rounds at the ground around where this person might be hiding. And it will, you know, using the fire hazard system, it could spread and flush them out. So many cool design ideas for these damage types and they want to get them in and make them meaningful. They are also working on disarray and this will interact with players' armors and suits and their systems on the sort of player character side of things, not the ship side. It's similar to an EMP, but for characters, uh, but that is a little further away. Uh, so next question, anything to say regarding sidearms like machine pistols, sawn off shotguns, and so on and so forth. So currently they say they are doing a full on weapon audit, analyzing what we have at the moment and working out how useful they are and how they can be improved. It is an all encompassing audit with them also doing competitive analysis of them all, comparing them to real world counterparts and how they want them to work as intended. Now he did give off some examples of changes coming to pistols and other weapons. The LH-86 pistol from Gemini is to become a machine pistol, so it's more meaningful and impactful they say. When they create these changes it will come with a whole new recoil animation and look a little bit more appropriate as well. Another pistol getting changed up is the Arclight laser pistol which is the base default pistol that we all start with. This will potentially become a three round burst pistol to give it a bit more variety. Now, personally, I really love both the LH-86 and the Arclight, and I would prefer them to just create a brand new weapon to fill these burst or machine pistol roles, as I do love having these pistol choices. I'm not completely opposed to this, but I do hope that the weapons are not just locked to fully auto or burst, and you can maybe have the option to semi-auto fire them. I'm sure there will be more options down the line. In fact, they do mention that a little later on, which I will talk about in a second. But I do feel it would be a big shame to see the LH-86 and Arclight get changed beyond, I suppose, general balance. But never mind. Uh, other weapon changes include the Bayering P4, which they say apparently looks completely different, which I am very happy to hear about, as this weapon was pretty much the very first assault rifle 
uh, or ballistic assault rifle. And I think it was built way before bearing style was established. So to me, it really stands out as a non-bearing weapon and it looks very old, very dated, and it hasn't really sat right for me for a while. So I'm excited that they are changing that. They basically say that a lot of the weapon's functionality are a little too samey to other ones. So they are looking into other characteristics to help make them stand out. For example, the Klaus and Werner Gallant could become a burst weapon like a three round or a five round burst switch. The Lumen 5, which is currently a five round burst SMG, could be almost fully automatic as the downtime between shots take a lot less time. So if you are managing that timer properly, you could make it fully automatic. The S71 Marksman rifle, also from Gemini, has a weird recoil and they want it to feel more like a real world Marksman rifle with consistent offset pattern recoil. Uh, finally, the arrowhead shakes when it aims, which isn't good, and I've never really considered that, but it's so true. And they're working out how to make a Klaus and Werner sniper rifle more interesting. So a lot of work going on. Lots of progress, they say, has been made to making the weapons feel amazing and tying them into the manufacturers a lot more. They don't want all weapons currently to feel the same, and they want them all to have varying strengths and weaknesses. Now, they did say that down the line, they will make more weapons that do feel the same, but for right now, they want to have a wide breadth of options to see how they are applied in the PU. It's a long process, they say, and will continue for a long time, but they have made great changes now uh, that we should see in the near future. Now, firstly, I'm very glad that they specified long term that they will get more similar weapons, as of course, Choice is a huge aspect of Star Citizen and having one option for one type is definitely not what Star Citizen is about. So it does make sense and that's put my mind at rest. Also, they are creating differences here just to give more identity, variation and gameplay choices with those plans to make similar weapons further down the line. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, but most importantly, though, it is music to my ears to hear that they are auditing all the weapons, getting them as balanced as possible, I suppose, getting them more to their gold standard level, uh, balancing them and making sure that none of them are overpowered or underpowered. That has been needed for a long while, so I'm really excited to see these changes. So next question, climbing and mantling is a little lackluster and unintuitive. It is really limited. Are there any plans to change this? And they say, yes, they are working on some things right now, like a ledge grab, which will come at some point. Obviously, no dates. There are many general improvements to being able to climb anything at waist height as well, which would make sense. Also, right now, everything is actually manually marked up for what is climbable, which clearly makes no sense for a game of this scale. So they are planning to get it auto marked up, which is more of a long term plan, not something anytime soon. Again, very glad that this is being addressed. I'm sure they will find a much better process to this, maybe even a procedural system, as what we have right now is really limited and extremely restrictive and inconsistent, actually, for a game of this scale. Anyway, next question. Will we get non-lethal and other melee weapons? Now, they say 100% they do need non-lethal weapons for bounty hunting, for example. Uh, they have concepted a taser or a stun gun, and they know what it looks like. They just need to build it. It will use a similar damage type to the lightning bolt weapons that we have, but instead of killing people, it will just cause stun damage. For melee weapons, they do want all various types of melees, like swords, improvised weapons like crowbars, axes, and so on and so forth. They want them all. I'm sure they will bring a huge slew of different weapons uh, that we can imagine and things that we can imagine. Next question, will heavy armor prevent players from using operator seats and so on? And they say they have actually just spoken about this internally. The plan is for both medium and heavy armor to not allow you to use operator seats that have complex controls. As it doesn't really make sense considering the thickness of the gloves and the chest piece, for example. Plus, I, you know, you see it clipping through the seat all the time, which doesn't look good. So you will have to wear either light armor or a flight suit outfit in order to operate certain controls or ship cockpits. Most ships and vehicles will come with lockers to allow you to store these armor sets so that you can grab them when you get out of the seat. But for all combat armors of all types, you will be factoring in weight, stealth, speed and protection and so on, as well as the ability to fly. So yes, that will be coming down the line, but we don't know when. Uh, talking of which, it was mentioned a while back that armor archetypes are supposed to be coming along. Is there any progress here? And right now they are currently filling out what types of styles they should have. Right now there are four archetypes. We've got combat, specialist, utilitarian and support armors. So combat armor is of course your soldier. 
Good for combat, good for damage mitigation as you would expect. Specialist is your bounty hunting and assassination style role armors. Stealthy, capable of mitigating some damage, but not as much as a combat armor. Utilitarian is for things like exploration, I suppose, mining and salvage and so forth. Good for environmental protection, good inventory sizes and support armors are good for things like power generation, maybe a, an increased carrying capability. Players could probably give you all the magazines, all the energy magazines, and you could be a walking charging battery. Uh, but all of this is coming along well, still a long way to go, and they don't want to roll them out yet until they have more gameplay reasons to choose them. Next question is, will combined weight of armor, weapons, backpacks, and equipment affect stamina, dehydration, and so on? And they say, yes, it already does to some degree. Stamina, for example, in light armors, allow you to run twice as long as it would if you were wearing a heavy armor which in turn does affect your hunger and thirst so if you're wearing a heavy armor and sprinting everywhere you will get thirstier hungrier drain your stamina much quicker than someone in a light armor they are going to continue to evaluate and balance this as more things get added but that currently does affect things uh, will loot boxes drop more rare items they say yes kind of they will drop higher quality items and some of those will be rarer I mean, the sky's the limit for these loot boxes, depending on where you go to get them, how difficult they are to get to. So I would certainly expect a lot of rare different types of items. Uh, will we be able to subdue players by way of gadgets, handcuffs, zip ties, and so on? And they say they are talking about adding restraints like handcuffs. Ideal, of course, for uh, bounty hunting. Also sedatives as well, which the new medical mechanics make possible. So yes. Will there be different backpacks for other things beyond storage, like thruster packs, jump packs, portable radars, scanners, radios, computers, parachutes, and so on? And they say, yes, there will be profession-orientated backpacks that link up with the suits to provide specialist equipment. It's very early days at the moment for that, though. Nothing about jump packs was said, though, uh, but they do have modular backpacks coming so you can take parts on and off like power plants or maybe oxygen tanks. Really like the sound of this. It'll be insane when we have an expedition to maybe a hostile environment and you and your crewmates are all trying to work out together what the best equipment is to take. Like one of you would be a support role, one of you might be, or the rest of you might need environmental protection. Really love this diversity. Next question, uh, what are your thoughts on smoke grenades? A great question, I have had this want for a while. And they say, yes, they are doing these for concealment but they do like the idea of them being maybe different colors for marking areas. They are doing a whole bunch of different grenades, like incendiary, EMP, smoke, noise, stun. And I do believe there was an image, well, I know there was an image from a while ago with color-coded grenades from Bayring, and they will likely create all real-world variant grenades as well as some quite sci-fi ones. I think, or I'm pretty sure, a gravity grenade was mentioned. Don't quote me on that, but I, I'm sure something was there. Uh, but I would love smoke grenades, especially for the medic career. So if you're in a bit of a hot zone and you're doing a medivac extraction, throwing down some smoke grenades to conceal your movements, get the injured players out of the danger zone and then get them out of there. Next question, will we see some alien FPS weapons? And they say they will at some point. First, they want to get standard weaponry or human manufactured weaponry. Now they're looking more into the exotic human weaponry like the vault weapons and like we saw with lightning bolt after that it will be alien weapons will there be more fps gadgets and they say yes a lot more gadgets are coming deployable shields we know there's proximity and laser mines coming soon i think with the next patch 316 for laser trip mines riot shields are planned as well and even deployable turrets now i will say way back in 2015 they did work on some deployable holograms, so do expect a vast array of different FPS gadgets and deployables. Uh, and again, the sky is the limit for this kind of thing. Some of them will be more real world, some of them will certainly be more sci-fi. Next question, what are happening with night vision goggles? Are we going to get them? Now, they have different scope features planned for the future with different manufacturers maybe having different tech levels. Things like infrared night vision and some even calling out targets based on your FPS radar and scanner. Also, each helmet type may have varying visor readouts depending on the role. For example, support suits might give you health readouts on your visor of the players in the environment without needing to use your tools. Or environment suits might provide more environmental data. This is going to be so cool. I love how they are creating a real need for each player to fill a role. Like their role will be important and relying on other people will be important. I mean, you could solo this stuff, but you are limited to maybe one type of outfit. 
Amazing detail, all this. Uh, anyway, next question and last question. Will we get weapon holsters for overclothing? And they say it is something that they want. Having more useful and functional clothing, holsters, bandoliers, and so on and so forth. They would like to see how far they can go, but the character team have a lot of work to get on with, so don't expect anything like that soon. But of course, don't rule it out. So that was this week's dedicated FPS Q&A. It was one of my favorite Star Citizen lives in a long while. So great to hear more about what to expect with things like salvaging, hacking sounds phenomenal, gadgets, grenades, plus the fact that they are now doing a weapon audit is music to my ears. It has been something we have needed for such a long time now. We will certainly be talking more about this over on Twitch next week, so be sure to join me at twitch.tv forward slash Ryan. The link's in the description below if you would like to hang out and talk more about this. Sorry for the super long episode of Star Citizen Sunday, but this stuff is golden. Anyway, let us move on. So also this week, Inside Star Citizen took a look at two new vehicles that made it to the verse in 3.15.1. We have the Anvil Spartan Ground APC, and the Aegis Redeemer gunship. Now, I won't be covering these vehicles on Star Citizen Live, as I think each one does deserve its own dedicated video. So do keep an eye out here for those videos on my YouTube channel. There was also a Spartan Q&A, which I will include in my dedicated video, or at least bring that information at the same time. I did personally CCU my ROC to a Spartan, which was only like $9, and it is a lot of fun. Very useful for org training, and we have had a lot of use for it already. The Intergalactic Aerospace Expo 2951 kicked off last week and it does continue throughout this week along with a free flight until the 1st of December. So if you are interested in trying Star Citizen for free, if you're on the fence about it, make sure you head over to the RSI website and create an account. If you have a friend or someone who is already playing the game that you want to help out, do ask them for a referral code as you will still get the Argo cargo or MPUV vehicle for free and 5,000 United Earth credits or just simply use the one in the top left hand corner of this video and get signed up. Now each day a new manufacturer takes to the halls for I think about 48 hours allowing everyone to rent almost every ship for free. Just simply click on the ship by holding down the F key and then left clicking and then for 48 hours you can try that ship out. Now, this event is only going to get better with two more ships yet to be revealed. One from Argo being the Argo Raft and one from Misk, the Misk Odyssey. So do keep checking in every day, although it does destroy the server, but I'm sure more surprises are yet to come. This week, we also had a new roadmap update, which I have covered in a separate video. That is linked in the description below, should you want to check that out. A new Kaizen post was also released for all the lore buffs out there. It was talking about medical insurance, plus there is tons of daily information about the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo with ship manufacturer posts and opportunities so that you can maybe buy the ship if you would like to. You don't have to, don't worry about it. Most of these ships can be earned in-game anyway. Uh, there is new merchandise available and discounted game packages too, so if you are looking to take the plunge and buy into Star Citizen, then do check out these discounted packages. Again, linked in the description below. And finally, Star Citizen backing has reached well, not actually not just reached, but shot way past $400 million in funding, which is just insane, but also brilliant. So congratulations to CIG and actually to all of us really for continuing this dream. It is an absolute pleasure. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.